okay so here we are it is september 15th 2021 and we are at our special teaching on yom kippur the day of atonement this is the you know uh sixth of the seven feasts of the lord steve and uh it, you know here we are it's uh probably about what is it about an hour short of sundown and Yom Kippur for 2021, the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the year in, you know, in all of the feasts of Israel and the end of the 10 days of awe that began on Rosh Hashanah, which we looked at last week, and the end of the special, you know, uh, holy days for the year in each year. Uh, we, we have a couple of other, you know, we've got one last seventh of the seven, um, Feast of the Lord coming up. That will be uh, coming up in a matter of days. That's the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, also known as Sukkot. But Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year, Steve. So we're going to unpack that. We're going to look at some verses that suggest uh, how Yom Kippur is to be looked at for those of us that are in the body of Christ, as well as uh, you know how our Jewish friends who still are looking for the Messiah but don't recognize Jesus as that Messiah yet and all of that. So we're going to look at all those things tonight. The six of our seven teachings on the Feast of Israel, and you can go back to our YouTube page, uh, South Beach Gospel uh, Ministries. Um, look on our YouTube page under Feast of Israel, and you'll see all six of the ones, uh, five of the ones we've done already. We've already gone through the four uh, springtime harvest festivals. We ended with Pentecost and then remember we said that the church age was was sort of the long growing summer season. After you plant the seeds in the springtime you would let the seeds grow over the summertime and then you would begin with the fall harvest which would be Rosh Hashanah or the head of the year. We looked at that last year and we talked about how that is a picture of the rapture. But for the final time, Steve, since this is your last time out, you'll be heading out for uh, Alabama win. Early in the morning. Tomorrow morning, Steve, Tomorrow is that morning. right? Yes, this sir. is your last evening oh, in not only Miami Beach, but the state of Florida. So you'll be off on your way uh, to, to, to strike out. And hopefully you'll be able to you know, establish a beachhead you know, for the Lord with uh, some materials and you'll continue on the work. And as it turns out, we got a new person that's going to show up for duty on Saturday. And all you guys out there, you can't wait to introduce you to Steve's replacement. Younger, prettier version of Steve. Not as good a golfer, for sure. But pretty aerobically fit yeah. and, and yeah. you know, led a bunch of jazzercise classes and all that and, <laughs> and had an uh, intense conversion experience with the Lord and wow. just out of the blue, Steve, I mean, because the interesting thing for those of you out there in video land that don't know, Steve and I have been doing this together for about 10 years, but the day Steve started was a Saturday after the guy that I had been doing the ministry street evangelism with kind of just kind of quit, uh, you know, with no advance. We, you know, didn't get 15 day notice. And after three months, he was just like, it wasn't for him. And the next week, I'm like, I got to show up by myself to do it. And who shows up with this guy on his bike? And I was like, this guy from the Calvary Chapel Bible study, Steve, what was his last name? And you were like, uh, what, are you, what are you doing? I love him doing a teaching, pass out tracks. And you're like, well, you know, I've been doing you know, sharing the gospel with guys over at Flamingo Park playing basketball on Saturday, I guess I'll give it up and just join you. And we've been together for, for over a decade now, and that's how it worked wow. out. So, so with, with that being the case, Steve, for the final time, why don't you open us up in a word of prayer, and then we'll go on into your last evening, and we'll look at the holiest day of the year in the calendar, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, how it relates to Christ and our relationship with Him. Evo. Lord God, we thank you. I thank you for your word. Thank you for one last time for us to uh, gather. It's been a long journey. I enjoyed working with her. It's been a, a, boy, how do I even begin, Lord? Just a grind for sure. <laughs> but but fruitful one indeed, Lord. I just I don't know elsewise, you know, what else I would have done, but you know, you put me in 
me and her in the same path and on the same same field to to harvest, Lord. I'm just so grateful for it. And I pray that, you know, it continues on for as long as it needs to. But more than that, Lord, I pray that you would return sooner than that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I agree, Steve. I, I hope so. You know, like I said, uh, you know, the Rosh Hashanah is like a picture or a type of the rapture. And it's come and gone. And But interestingly enough, a number of Jewish people that are religious but not Christians, not Messianic Jews, they look for the Messiah the long-awaited Messiah that they've been waiting for for millennia. They are looking for, many of the Orthodox rabbis and adherents are looking for a Messiah to show up on Yom Kippur. The Messiah will show up and cleanse the land of Israel from sin. And so, yeah, so we are in very ripe prophetic time. So Steve, thanks for that. And, you know, again, uh, you know, symbolically giving you a gold Rolex. <laughs> This isn't gold, nor is it a Rolex, but it, it's symbolic of the awesomeness that Steve uh, ha, has, uh, you know, earned over the course of the years of work here, which I won't be able to recompense, but the Lord, the Lord, man, will be giving Steve a big mansion with a bunch of stuff, man, a bunch of stuff. So, man, but uh, so for those of you out there, yeah, stay tuned for Saturday and we'll be introducing Steve's new replacement, Kimberly. We'll be, be joining up to help pass our track because it's just impossible to stand in front of a mic and, get, and preach a message to the, to the masses and be able to pass our tracks at the same time. It's just, it's, 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 it's literally impossible for one man to do it. And in scripture, we see two by two, always send them out in two. So, you know, um, and, and, and your backup Genevieve is up in DC for now doing stuff with her um, I guess it's with her grandson, you know, is she working out some things and, you know, she was, she lived up in DC when she worked at the Pentagon. So she's in the DC area, right in Northern Virginia. So she's not available for duty for who, who maybe till the end of the school year. So luckily, you know, there's no such thing as luck though. Right, you know, right. by the Lord's providence, you know, he, he provided, Kim dropped her down like man out of heaven. So I'm thankful for that. So I was like, Saturday, goodness forbid, what am I going to do? My first Saturday all alone in a bajillion years. And it, it didn't come to that. So, and then the rapture could come at any moment. So it's good. So, but anyway, so yeah, let's take a look real quick at my Feast of the Lord prophecy timeline chart that I kind of made up myself. And, you know, I've been able, you know, thanks to our, our brother Albert Pelletri, donated this book to the ministry some time back. Dispensational Truth by Clarence Larkin has a number of awesome charts in there. And I've used, you know, his chart book, which was written probably, what, in the early 1900s or something like that? Um, you know, a very well-known and evangelical Bible prophecy circles. And I finally got my hands on one and I've been able to use it to help construct my own Feast of the Lord timeline chart. And so what we're going to do is take a look at, again, the seven feasts overall. And I've drawn the menorah, the seven branch candelabra for the nation of Israel, symbolic of the nation of Israel, and, and tried to match that in to each one of those seven feasts. So we start out with the Feast of Passover. Really, the Jewish New Year, the secular New Year, begins, um, you know, in, uh, in you know, Rosh Hashanah, which they call the head of the year. But really, the biblical New Year is in the springtime with the Passover, of course, Steve. So the first of our feasts uh, is the Feast of Passover we looked at. And that is a shadow or a picture of what? Jesus dying on the cross for us on Nisan 14 of 32 AD, the Passover was being celebrated while Jesus was, you know, be, you know, hanging on the cross. You had the Passover lambs being presented to the temple. And while they were being presented at the temple, they were, as I adjust my camera here, see, I'm, I'm my own cameraman as well. So I'm multitasking, Steve, multitasking. So uh, what we find out then is that Jesus was the Passover lamb. And after he was buried, after being crucified, what? He was buried in the ground and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which transcends right out of Passover. Passover starts the Feast of Unleavened Bread that runs for a period of time. And that's the three days and three nights that Jesus is in the earth. Um, and remember, we talked about the Jewish ceremony, um, you know, the Passover Seder, where you would wrap 
um, you know, the, you know, the matzah cracker that has holes pierced in it and it's striped because it's baked, but it, you know, you're not supposed to break it, but you wrap it in linen and then you go hide it somewhere and then the kids have to go and search for it. Whichever kid finds the wrapped matzah bread wrapped in linen gets a special prize. It's a type or a shadow of Jesus being buried for our sins, you know, and being in the ground three days and three nights. And then whoever discovers him gets eternal life. And so uh, the three days and three nights in the earth is a type of the unleavened bread feast. And the Lord, you know, you know, puts in the Bible, it says the whole of the book, it is written of me. The whole book from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus, God, human flesh, and the kinsman redeemer of the human race, how he came to save us. And so we then get to the third of those feasts of the Lord that are laid out for us in Leviticus chapter 23. We find out that first fruits, which is a period of time, which is part of what they call the Feast of Weeks, Steve. You'd have seven weeks of seven days, and then the very next day after the seven weeks of seventh day would be the 50th day after the Passover, which would also be a special period of time. So you'd have first fruits, which would occur prior to that 50th day, and that was a type of the resurrection of Jesus three days after the Passover, which we have occurring on Nisan 17 of 32 AD. So when Jesus is rising from the dead, you have the Jews celebrating first fruits, which is when you would gather in the first fruits of, of the springtime growing season. You, you'd have some early crops come up and you would take those crops and you'd take them to the temple and you would give the first fruits to the Lord by sacrificing those at the temple, the grain um, and wheat offerings of that nature. Excuse me. And since Jesus was the very first person to ever be resurrected from the dead permanently, he had already raised Lazarus from the dead, the widow of Nain's son, uh, the little girl, uh, Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, right. All those people had risen to the dead before Jesus was crucified, but they all died again. None of those people stayed alive after being raised from the dead, not even Jesus' friend Lazarus. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, the first permanently resurrected son of Adam. <clears throat> and that's why he referred to himself as, you know, the son of man. He wanted you to know I'm in a real human body that's going to, through my resurrection power, become alive again forever. And so then <clears throat> we already talked about it. The Feast of Weeks would lead up to the day of Pentecost. So you'd have seven weeks of seven days, which would give you 49 days. And then the very next day, the 50th day would be 50 days after the Passover, which is where you get the term Pentecost, Penta 50 in Greek. Uh, Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, celebrated by the Jews for reasons that they didn't fully understand, but it was a type of the founding of the church. That's when the Holy Spirit came down and filled the believers of Jesus with the Holy Spirit and the tongues of fire came down. They were able to speak in foreign languages that they didn't know. How, how are we speaking these languages? And it was a supernatural miracle that we read about in Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 1 through 4, that we see is a type um, of the birth of this new entity that Jesus said he would call his church. And for 2,000 years, we've been doing what? The work of the church is the evangelism of the good news of the gospel, not the good news of the prosperity gospel right off screen there. You know, I have, you know, TBN and this guy from Church by the Glades, the church I used to attend, he would dress up like Spider-Man one week and then Prince another week. And then he'd have, you know, circus carnival people in the, in the sanctuary and tarot cards readers and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, man, this is this apostasy. This is blasphemy. It was the, the first, the guy that preceded you in the street evangelism. And that was one of the things where we kind of parted company over. I thought, you know, you can't have apostasy in the church like having tarot card readers and circus members in your church because it'll get a lot of, you know, clicks on the internet and get you on TV and stuff like that. And so for those reasons, apostasy is in the church, which is Matthew 24. We just finished a two-week series on that, and uh, our, our friend, you, you, 
your 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 replacement Kim. She was telling me the other day, like, man, I got through both. I mean, those were like two hour long videos yeah, each. She went through all four that's four hours in just yeah. like half a day. She went, God, I went through those. What's next? Yeah. What are you teaching on Saturday? I want to study up in advance. And I said, Kim, man, if it's you, you know, where have all the men gone anymore, Steve? I said, if, you know, if half the guys I've encountered had the same zeal for eating the word of God, that's how you know you have a real born again experience. And I've, I've, I've asked her to give uh, a little bit of that testimony. So you get a chance to check that out on Saturday when we get that up and post it. Um, but yeah, you know, you're really born again when you have a hunger for the word of God, when you just can't get enough of it and you're like, okay, what's next? Uh, I already got through those and you know, now I'm ready to, to, to do more stuff. And so that was one of the things that I knew when I was a kid that I knew that I knew that I was saved is I had an insatiable desire to, I was reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and dude, it was like my Marvel comics. You know, I couldn't wait to get to the next chapter. It was so exciting. And then I found the book of Revelation and that was even better than the Avengers and, and, and Spider-Man, you know, you know, team up, you know, two for one where you get two superhero groups going together. Like, man, that was super exciting, but this was even more exciting than that, the book of Revelation. So um, then we get into the gap between the fourth and final of the springtime um, Feast of the Lord. And then you have that long four month summer season. That's when the seeds have been planted and they're now, you, you're sowing seeds, planting seeds, so that in the fall you can have a harvest. And so that long four month gap between the springtime uh, Feast of the Lord, one, two, three, and four, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost, is a type of the church age, Steve, which has now lasted for two millennial days. That is to say, for 2,000 years. And we started the fall feast, the three final feasts of the Lord. Again, seven's that magic number of completion for the Lord. We looked at Rosh Hashanah, or the Feast of Trumpets, last week, and we saw that that was a type of the rapture of the church, where you're out in the field harvesting, you know, trying to pick stuff off to, to take it in, and then you hear a trumpet blast. And when you hear that final trumpet, ta -ba -da -ba, ta -ba -da -ba, ta -ba -da -ba, boom, you drop what you're doing and you went straight into the temple. If you had st still had stuff on the vine that you needed to harvest, it just didn't get harvested. You got what you could and now you go in and celebrate in the temple the harvest that you did do and you celebrate a time of being in the presence of the Lord. And that, oh, there's the guy that ripped me off at a thousand bucks, the, the Hillsong pastor, Brian Houston. So yeah, I got, I got my flat screen playing, you know, the, the Christian television gives me a reminder of how the apostasy is coming. Um, anyway, so we looked at how Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets last week was a type or a picture of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, which leads us to the sixth of the seven, which will begin in about 45 minutes here on South Beach in Miami Beach, Florida, when the sun goes down, Rosh, uh, excuse me, uh, the final of the 10 days of awe will begin the high holy day of the year, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. Uh, Yom being the Hebrew word for day, Kippur, uh, the Hebrew word that makes reference to uh, covering, atonement, you know, substitution. It is a type of the atoning, the day that Israel's sins are atoned for. Ooh, it's a really interesting group of passages we're gonna look at where you had things, uh, all these interesting types or shadows. And it's fun to look at the Old Testament once you've been born again, and now the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And it can help you understand all these crazy old, you know, ceremonial things and dietary laws and all these strange rituals in the Old Testament that as a kid, you'd hear about it. If you go to church as a kid and you hear the preacher, preacher passing about the scapegoat and the scapegoat will be turned loose into the wilderness. And you were like, okay. And people, amen. And I'm like, what? is a scapegoat and that's when my sister blamed me for taking the last cookie in the cookie jar and whatever and so the whole concept ties together the scapegoat being a type of christ you know you'd have the priest on the day of atonement you would take one of the goats and you sacrifice make them blood sacrifice but he had to be a year old steve why because you were atoning for the sins of the nation of israel for the preceding year um some of the more mystical jewish rabbis say that the Day of Atonement is the only day of the year where Satan can't accuse uh, Israel 
because in you know uh, their the, the, the numerical number system uh, you know what's that called the uh, neural where each number uh, why is it escaping me numerology? No. no not it's almost like numerology where you know each letter has a, a numerical each Hebrew letter has a numerical uh -huh. significance and because the word spells out you know like uh, Satan three is equivalent to 364 sure. that means that on the last day of the year or 365th day of the year he he's not present so some of the more mystical hebrew rabbis would say you know the day of atonement is the only day that satan can't you know accuse you and interestingly enough they also had a tradition or belief that again you know rosh hashanah started the 10 days of all leading up to the high holy day of the year yom kippur and it was believed that 10 days earlier 10 days prior to the Day of Atonement, the first of the days of awe, which began with Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, that God would enter your name into one of two books, the Book of Life, which we know about from the Book of Revelation, or the Book of Death. Ooh, kind of very similar to the Book of Revelation, which hadn't been written yet. And it's during those 10 days that the nation of Israel, individually, each person would repent for their sins and ask for forgiveness. And on the 10th day, you wouldn't do any work. It was a super sad. You wouldn't do any work. You, you couldn't even wear shoes now. Like some Orthodox rabbi, you can't wear leather shoes because it's a type of work, which is a type of saying that salvation is not of works. My Pentecostal and charismatic friends, Jehovah's Witnesses, Roman Catholic, you can't earn your way into heaven by doing good works. Yom Kippur was a type of saying that you do no work on this super, super Sabbath day, the high holy day of the year, because God is not interested in your works in terms of making a covering or an atonement for your sins. The only thing that can atone for sin, Steve, we learned from the book of Hebrews is what? Shedding of blood. Blood. You have to shed blood. And again, so people will be scared. Like during the year, I was pretty bad. This, these are the last 10 days of the year. I don't know whether on Rosh Hashanah, the Lord entered my name in the book of death. And on Yom Kippur, I die. So you pray that the Lord will reverse his ruling on you. And, you know, if, if you were contrite enough, the Lord would switch over and give you another year of grace. And so we had that interesting teaching about the two goats. The one goat would, would have to be a year old because yep. you're atoning for all 365 days of the year or in the Jewish calendar, 360 day years. So you would have to have a goat whose blood would be sacrificed so that his blood would cover each day. If he was only six months old, he only cover half the year. So he had to be a full year old to cover all the sins for every day for the nation of Israel. Then the priest would take a separate goat, grab him by the head, and he would confess on that goat the sins of the entire nation of Israel for that year and then send him off into the wilderness. And that guy was known as the scapegoat who goes off into the wilderness to die is a type or a picture of Jesus, you know, being crucified outside the city of Jerusalem, outside the temple, hanging up on a cross, you know, let us go to him outside the gates, which is where the crucifixion actually uh, took place on Mount Calvary, outside the city gates of Jerusalem. The scapegoat being sent off into the wilderness is a type that the old Jewish rabbis, you know, didn't understand prior to Christ and even after Christ, that that was a type of Jesus being driven outside the city gates of Jerusalem and crucified for our sins as the literal scapegoat. He's the Passover lamb and he's the scapegoat. He's the lamb whose blood is sacrificed to atone for our sins, but he's the goat upon whom all the sins of the whole nation have fallen. The goat, you know, and God judges them, sends them out in the wilderness to be destroyed, which is what happened to Jesus at Calvary. And so you have all of that type and symbology laid out for us in Yom Kippur. So we're going to look at the verses that, that tie that together. And so it's my argument that if Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, which we looked at, you know, of, you know 10 days earlier, was a type of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, then it makes sense to look at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, as a type of the seven-year, 70th week of Daniel, which we kind of have laid out for us right here in our 70th week of Daniel chart. Remember, pre-tribulation rapture of the church, Rosh Hashanah. Here's our long summer growing season, the church age. That's the summer season. 
that separates the four springtime feasts from the fall feast, the final three, that starts with Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, followed by Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, which is a type of the 70th week of Daniel, or the seven-year tribulation period, which will be concluded by the second coming of Christ, which is a type, if you will, of the seventh of those feasts of Israel, the final of the seven feasts, tabernacles, or booth in Hebrew called Sukkot, Sukkot, a booth, a dwelling place, a tent, when God actually dwelt in a big tent with the nation of Israel as they were wandering through the wilderness, leaving Egypt for the promised land. That's a type, Steve, of the millennial reign of Christ when Jesus will come down from the Father's house in heaven and dwell with us in the temple that's rebuilt. He's going to be in the, the, the tabernacle. It's a type of cloth temple wherein the presence of God actually dwelt during their wanderings through the wilderness. Like God is going to be with us in the final days of the planet Earth. And then after that final day, which is a thousand years long, eternity or the eighth day will begin. So let's go ahead and take a look at, uh, first off, let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Joel chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Steve, I've talked about the day of the Lord before and how the tribulation period is a dark and you know, troublesome time period for the people of the planet Earth, but specifically for the nation of Israel. And it's commonly referred to as the, the time of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord, the great tribulation period, and um, fiddling around with this thing. And so go ahead and take a, take a gander through that, Steve, and read for me Joel chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the ears of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. Wow, Steve, how apropos. Read for us again verses 1 and 2. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. Stop right there. Take a look out the window. Man, it's almost <laughs> like the Lord's given a special... We got clouds and dark, dark clouds are rolling in yeah. over the Atlantic Ocean and the Biscayne Bay coming through here to South Beach. It's starting to get dark out and I'm, I'm noticing storm clouds off in the distance. We've got yeah. storm clouds and, you know, it's a day of darkness. And, you know, me, I'm a, I'm a color guy, Steve. If you notice, if you look at any of my videos or whatever, you always see me in some bright, shiny colors because we're trying to attract the attention of people down on South Beach. But today, being Yom Kippur, I'm... Outfit it, even my underwear. You have to take my word for it. Even my underwear are black, you know, because it's the day of mourning. This is, you know, as I'm thinking today, I'm like, oh man, I got all these sins of my own, you know. And I was reading one uh, article written by a Christian pastor that said, you know, it's a day of stress for a lot of people in Judaism because you, you're worried about the sins of the year and you're trying to pray that God will give you forgiveness. Man, you don't want to be in the Lord's book of death. And he says, isn't it great that we already have an advocate with the Father and we don't have to stress out on Yom Kippur and be like, oh my gosh. Because like, I was thinking today, like, you know, I've been under so much stress and pressure trying to get think work-related stuff, the ministry stuff, mm -hmm. Steve relocating to Alabama, me trying to say, how are we going to outfit South Beach with Steve's over in Alabama? Uh, how's he, uh, and I'm here in South Beach, how's, and Genevieve's up in D.C. How's this all going to work out? You know, and, and so, you know, and I, then I'm thinking, like, all the shortcomings and moral failings of my own. I'm like, man, I, I suck, man. Day of Atonement's coming. But then, I, oh, but wait, Jesus already died on the cross to take care of all this. So I don't have to worry about whether my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life or, you know, wiped out it, because, you know. But symbolically, I got my all black on, got my black shirt, black vest, 
black pants, black shoes, even black underwear, Steve, because it's a day of clouds and thick darkness. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, time of serious, serious repentance before the Lord. And, you know, as we said, it's the last of the 10 days of all when the Lord is making a decision about your fate. And that is done on an individual basis. And it's done on a corporate national basis with the nation of Israel. And so that's where we get some of the verses from. And um, if we could, let's just take a look, Steve. I'm going to have us go on to Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, read for us verses 26 through 28. That gives us the imprimatur from the Lord for this feast uh, day that's known as the Day of Atonement. Leviticus is... You know, part of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, that lays out all these strange religious ceremonies and practices that the nation of Israel was mandated to, uh, you know, countenance and look at. So Leviticus 23, and then read for us verses 26 through 28. If you could, that would be swell. Leviticus 23, uh, chapter 23, verses uh, 26 through 28. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Hmm. Wow, Steve, that's heavy duty. Let's go ahead and stay in Leviticus, but bounce over two chapters and give me verses 33 to 43. Leviticus chapter 25. Let's go over to verse 33. And goodness gracious, man, not going to have you to be right. I guess I'll be doing my own reading from now on. Um, uh, but, but give me 33 to 43. And if a man purchase of the Levites, then the house that was sold in the city of his possession, possession Shall go in, shall go out in the year of jubilee, for the houses of the cities of the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the field of the suburbs, suburbs of their cities may not be sold, for it is the perpetual possession. But if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee, then thou shalt relieve him. And let me stop you right there. Let me jump you ahead, actually. Let's jump over to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 30, and let's take a look at verse 10. And again, these are all kind of precatory. That's one chapter before the third book of the Bible, uh, or the third book of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible of the Torah. Take a look at Exodus chapter 30, and let's run through uh, verse 10. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once in a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonement. Once in a year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. And there's, there's Aaron who's acting in the role of the high priest who is required to make an atonement. Now, let's jump back into the book of Leviticus. Let's take a look at Leviticus chapter 16, Steve. Uh, going to 16, we're going to look at a couple of different sets of passages there. Let's start out with verses 3 and 4. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young, young bullock for sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and with the linen miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh and water, and put so them on. And he shall, it's just a six, third, right? To three, to okay. four. I'm sorry, four, there you go. Yep. Now, uh, you know, uh, so again, Aaron is acting in the role of the high priest, and he's got all these ceremonial duties that he has to take care of. Um, he has to be clean. He has to, you know, be ritualistically. Why? Because it's a type of sinlessness which we as human beings, as the nation of Israel demonstrated, would have to replicate year after year after year. Because, you know, it's funny, I was listening to a documentary and this one girl was saying that she had gone into a life of, after being molested as a child, she went into a life of prostitution and she learned how to trade sex for things that she wanted and, you know, made money out doing it, but it was empty inside. And then, you know, she said she met a person and the person was talking to her about, you know, 
how to feel clean inside. And she said, you know, once I, I got into the practice of doing that, you know, becoming involved in, in sex work, I would take showers. She said, I, I would scrub my body so hard till like almost became, you know, raw. You know, and, and the lady was saying to her, like, you know, you, no matter how hard you scrub the outside of your body, you can't wash away the sin that's inside. Mm -hmm. But Jesus can do that. And when, you know, Jesus through the word of God communicated that to her, she was like, man, sign me up for that. And she accepted Jesus as her savior because she was trying through the outward washing of the flesh to wash away her sins. And she was like, it didn't work. You know, I was like, I'm thinking three or four showers a day trying to wash away all the stuff that I had gotten involved in in terms of a sinful lifestyle, but it had scarred and stained her soul. And only the blood of Jesus could atone for that. And we found out, you know, without the shedding of blood, Steve, no remission, no remission of sin, Steve. So that's why the scapegoat and the sacrificial goat had to be at least 365 days or a year old because in, under the Jewish calendar, 360 days in a year, it would have to account for each one of the days of the nation of Israel's existence that preceding year in order for it to go forward. Now, move over to verses seven and eight, seven and eight of Leviticus 16. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, mm -hmm. one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Ah, oh, see, that means <laughs> either way, both the goats were, <laughs> Jesus, how can I say this euphemistically in a Christian radio show? Uh, you know, uh, both of the goats are kind of up the creek. Yeah. Uh, cast the lots, one goat's for the Lord, the other goat's, you know, the scapegoat. The goat for the Lord gets blood sacrificed and killed on the spot. The other, you, you, you pray the sins on him and then you send him out into the wilderness. Now some people say, well, maybe he survived or whatever, who knows, maybe the wolves got him or maybe he survived. But again, both of those goats are a type of Jesus Christ. One does the blood sacrifice and the other carries our sins away out into the wilderness as he went outside the camp to suffer for our sins at Calvary. Okay, pick us up at verses nine and 10 then. And Aaron shall cast lot upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. Wow, jump down to verses 13 and 14. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he, did, that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. It's interesting. It says in verse uh, 13 of Leviticus 16, and he, Aaron, this is the brother of Moses, you know, who the Lord selected as the priest, you know, do all these things. It says he had to put incense on the fire before the Lord because the incense covers up the funkiness of our sins. It's like we're a bunch of homeless people and we, we're wearing unwashed clothes. We've been wearing for six years. We haven't taken a bath in, you know, several years, the whole year. You've gone the whole year without taking a bath and your clothes smell and your body stinks. And God's so sensitive to sin that I'm so comfortable with that I can't even comprehend how offensive my best days are to him apart from the blood of Jesus. So Aaron, the high priest, had to burn incense or else God would kill him because of the funkiness of his sins for the prying year. So it just, Aaron's the Lord's guy. This is God's dude. If he would get struck dead for being funky because of his sins for the year without the incense, think about the rest of us that aren't the high priest, that aren't hand selected by the Lord. So it says, you know, it says, you know, he has to, you know, do the incense, you know, thing. And I was like, wow, all right. He shall put incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die, meaning otherwise he'd be killed. There's a temple on earth and there is a corollary metaphysical temple in heaven of which the temple on earth was a type or a shadow of. So when we're burning incense in the temple of the Lord on the temple mountain, Jerusalem, in heaven, in the real temple of God, at the Father's house in heaven, smoke is burning and incense is, is metaphysically rising through the space-time continuum to where God's presence actually is. So it's very important not to offend the Lord. Verse 22 of uh, Leviticus 16, Steve. 
and the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. Inhabited. Inhabited, I'm sorry. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Okay, and so, you know, it, it, it says that the, the scapegoat is takes all the sins of Israel and he's sent out into uninhabited land, out into the wilderness where he's by himself, just like Jesus went outside the camp and, you know, uh, was alone when he was being crucified. Then Aaron, in the next verse, says he has to take off his clothes and leave him there. You know, he's just all this crazy, weird stuff. But it's a type or a shadow, a picture of how serious God sees our sins as. And the Day of Atonement is a wonderful time for us as Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, to look at our Jewish brethren, who are our spiritual brothers and sisters, even if they haven't come to Christ yet, because they are the seed of Abraham. Remember, Abraham is the father of two races of people, the Jews who are the biological descendants of he and Sarah's union together, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, then the tribes of Israel, you know, uh, and the nation of Israel as, as it stands today. But then he'd also have a second spiritual family. God says, the sand of the sea, your descendants will be. That's the nation of Israel. The stars of the sky, your descendants will be as numerous as those of the born again Christians who aren't Jewish who are also Abraham's spiritual children, because through faith, he was able to lay the, light, the, the foundation for the Messiah coming into the human race through the Jewish people that Abraham fathered. And so, again, um, what we see then is that there's all types of ceremony and ritualistic things going on in the Day of Atonement that we can appreciate as believers and be grateful. This is a day of, should be, you know, sober reflection on how, and I thought about it today, like how short I come to the glory of God. But then it was an, also an opportunity to give Jesus credit for like, Jesus, you're my guy, man. I'm going out on South Beach, whether Steve is here or you dropped Kim out of the sky to help me, but even if not, I'll just go out and face death and destruction by myself then, you know, because you died for my sins because I'm such a bad person and I get to go to heaven and I even get to stand up in front of a camera and talk to people all the world around, you know. Um, I saw, you know, YouTube, you, you pointed out, you put a special like, you know, uh, it was a, the special uh, warning label on our teaching of, on 9-11 in the New World Order. Uh, we got the attention of YouTube again for the second time since we've been doing it. So like the New World Order is a conspiracy theory. So when, they, when they put a label on one of your videos, that means you're being noticed. And so, you know, we, we were noticed. Just, just down on South Beach on Saturday teaching about the New World Order and the second coming of Christ. And, you know, we, we drew attention. So my point is that it's an honor to even be able to stand up and do that. And you going off to Alabama, Steve, you're going to be passing out tracks. And, you know, just to let you guys, these are kind of our special South Beach Gospel Ministry tracks. See, it's got our little, our YouTube and Facebook page on there. And this is a special one we have about the rapture called Where Did They Go? This is my favorite one, Kathy. This is about a little girl dying of cancer who leads her friend to the Lord before she dies of cancer. And he's, aren't you afraid? Like, nope, I'm going to be with Jesus. And it's, it's, it's just heart touching. And then it's got our specially designed South Beach Gospel Ministries info and the logo I helped design. And then we've got friend or foes about the judgment seat of Christ and whether on the last day you're going to be Jesus' friend or you're going to be his foe. And so those are the tracks that Steve and, and eventually Kim and Genevieve and all who's, who have ever helped us. Those are the tracks we pass out and things of that nature. And so, again, back to our regularly scheduled programming, the Day of Atonement then. Okay, let's jump over to Isaiah, the great prophet of the nation of Israel. Isaiah chapter 53 gives us a picture in verse 6, again, of the Lord and the Lord prophetically announcing that he's going to lay upon him. Who? The scapegoat. Who's the scapegoat? Aaron? Nope. Aaron was the, the priest who did the incense. The scapegoat is the Messiah that's coming, that Israel is looking to show up on Yom Kippur. One of these Yom Kippurs, they expect the Messiah to show up and cleanse the land of Israel. We're minutes away from sundown. I can see the final rays of the sun that's setting off over in the west that way. Right out my window there, I can see the sun in the west setting, and it's reflecting sunlight off of some of the high-rises lined with glass over here on Miami Beach 
to the east so I can see the final rays of the sun reflecting in orange off the glass fronts of the high rises right out there so I can see the final moments before the day of when the sunlight glare off that glass facade of those high rises in my direct line of sight out there uh, along the Atlantic Ocean when that orange glow goes away that means the day of atonement Yom Kippur the most serious and, and sin conscious day of the year for the nation of Israel and for anybody who's a human being really because the, uh, Israel is a type of the human race and so again it's about to begin Yom Kippur the day of atonement will start any moment now a day of sober reflection and, and a, a, a day of gratitude and reflection sober reflection for Israel because they don't have a, 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 a temple sacrifice anymore they don't have a temple they can't do a blood sacrifice they don't have a priest to send the scapegoat out into the wilderness so what do they have to do they have to pray and pray really hard and try to do good works and do Lord please forgive me for all the sins of the year and that's why they, the 10 days of law can be such a scary thing for a serious minded Jewish person who's religiously observant as they don't have a temple they don't have a blood sacrifice that they can take a goat to for the day of atonement as commanded in the word of the Lord they don't have a scapegoat that a high priest can send out into the wilderness with their sins for the for the year so now they've got to do it on their own but if you're not good enough to do it on your own you can't be confident going into the presence of the Lord the Lord would have killed Aaron if the incense didn't cover the mercy seat to cover up the stench of his sins for that year Ooh, so the Lord is serious about sin and so let's take a look Isaiah chapter 53 verse 6 all we like sheep have gone astray we have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. that's the scapegoat wow. passage the scapegoat that we talked about or that Moses wrote about in Leviticus chapter 16 is the same person that centuries later Isaiah is writing about in Isaiah 53 6 the Lord has laid upon him the iniquities of us all the scapegoat isn't a four-footed animal that was a type or a shadow of the real scapegoat the real scapegoat was Mashiach ben David you know the son of Messiah the son of David you know who would take away from the nation of Israel the sins of the world even before Jesus birth before Christianity before the New Testament Israel already had an understanding that a Messiah was coming who would be the scapegoat for the nation of Israel and the Lord will lay upon him the iniquities of us all but wait wasn't the Messiah supposed to be the son of David who would reign upon a throne forever and of his kingdom there be no end but at the same time Isaiah said that the Messiah would be cut off and he would be killed his days would be be be, be, be cut short but then his his reigning and enduring will extend out into forever there were contradictory determine Isaiah was either schizophrenic or the Messiah had two different comings and we know of course Jesus had two different comings. the first coming came to be the suffering servant Messiah who would be the scapegoat who the Lord will pour out all his sins the, all of our sins upon and judge and then he'd go off into the wilderness but then when he came back the second time he would be the glorious king the son of David who would reestablish the throne of David sit upon it and reign forever from that reestablished throne of David so Isaiah perfectly lays out that picture for us now let's jump into the New Testament where the New Testament equivalent to the prophet Isaiah the Apostle Paul who wrote about 70 percent of the New Testament let's see what he has to say he really lays it out in plain language for us and makes us understand all of those strange mysterious passages in Leviticus and Exodus and Zechariah from the Old Testament in Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 and 12 Steve so we're gonna jump for those of you guys following along at home you're gonna jump all the way into the New Testament and let's pick it up with Hebrews, Hebrews 9, yes. chapter, chapter 9, verse 11. yep but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place and having obtained eternal redemption for us so Paul who was a religious scholar a Pharisee you know who 
was a, a lawyer of the religious law. He says, look, we understand Leviticus 23 and Leviticus chapter 16 about the scapegoat and how that was symbolic on the Day of Atonement to take away the sins of the nation of Israel, but just for that preceding year. And then you go into the new year and you're already one day in, you're in sin debt the first day out of the new year. You know, when the new day year starts, you already got sins for that first day that you're going to have to atone for by the end of the year. And so it was a never ending cycle of stress and fear. Is the Lord going to put me in, in the Lord's book of death as opposed to the Lord's book of life? But then Paul comes along and says, no, but as was promised by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53, verse six, when the Messiah did come on Nisan 14 of 32 AD, it says Christ came as the high priest of good things to come. He was uh, better than Aaron. He didn't have to put incense on his clothes because his clothes stink. And he didn't have to take off his priestly robes and leave them there because he had to be naked when he stood before the Lord because of the stench of his clothes. Jesus came as the perfect high priest of good things to come. The good things come for Israel during the Feast of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles is another way of saying dwelling place. Oikotirion is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew tabernacle, dwelling place. And so we find out then that the temple was foreshadowed by the tabernacle which traveled with Israel through the wilderness. And as I said, God actually dwelled in a big tent in the middle. The tabernacle tent was where the Lord's presence was and all the nation of Israel broken out into the different tribes uh, camped out around the ensign or banner for their particular tribe in uh, smaller tents in the form of a cross, by the way. If you were in a helicopter above it, you'd see God in the tabernacle in the center and the other tribes lined up in the form of a cross uh, around the tabernacle, which was a type of that which was to come. Paul says, Christ came as a high priest of good things to come with greater uh, and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. One, our bodies are a living tabernacle, a dwelling place of the Lord. Plus, there's gonna be a new Jerusalem which comes down from God out of heaven with a temple in it. Well, actually, there isn't gonna be a need for the temple in it because the Lord is gonna be the temple of it. He's gonna dwell in it with us. We won't have to go to a temple to have the presence of the Lord. The Lord is gonna dwell with us in, first off, the nation of Israel for a thousand years on this earth at the Feast of Sukkot, when that comes to fruition, prophetically speaking, then the 70th week of Daniel or the time of Jacob's trouble, which is a type or a picture, a shadow of Yom Kippur, um, which symbolizes the seven year period of time when Antichrist is ruling upon the earth and torturing, tormenting, and persecuting Israel and killing off 70% of all the Jews on earth during that period of time whereupon Jesus has to come back to rescue them or none of them will be left alive. Um, that time will end and will segue into the time of refreshing that comes from the presence of the Lord during the millennial reign of Christ, the final day of the millennial week of days I talked about, each day being a thousand years, that seventh day being the 1,000 year period of time when Jesus lives with us on the earth in a physical body for 1,000 years, the millennial day, the day of rest. The Sabbath day is the seventh day. It's the day of rest. We're gonna rest in the glory of Jesus. Jesus is gonna have all sin in, under control. He's gonna put Satan in prison for that seventh day. We are not gonna have to fight and, and toil and struggle. Like I'm thinking, now that Steve's gone, what's gonna have? Satan's gonna have some of his demonic hordes, you know, indwell some of the, you know, drug adult people on South. Remember I told you a couple weeks ago, some drug adult dude, demon possessed, no doubt, killed an innocent man just a few feet away from, no, I hope Kim doesn't hear us and get scared and say, I'm not coming. A few feet away from where we do street evangelism every Saturday. And goodness forbid, right about the same time as we do street preaching. But we happen to be out that week, you know. Um, but, you know, that's the world we live in. I'm like, what's Satan got planned for me this week? Oh, man, this is terrible. I'm not going to have to worry about that kind of stuff. I'm not going to be stepping out in faith anymore. I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord in a supernatural body that can't die. Satan will have no power over me anymore. So that's exciting. And so we looked at Hebrews chapter 11 and 12 when Paul says that, and he says, not with the blood of goats uh, and calves, 
but with his own blood, this is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, but with his, Jesus' own blood, he, Jesus, entered the most holy place on up in heaven, at the, at the temple in heaven, after, while he's being crucified, into the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You don't have to do it over and over and over again. Yom Kippur is a ceremonial ritual that Israel has to repeat over and over and over again until they come to accept Jesus' death on the cross as their once for all time uh, day of being atoned for the sins of the nation of Israel. And they're gonna do that uh, beginning at the midway point of the 70th week of Daniel or that seven year tribulation period. So then, let's, uh, with the time we have left then, Steve, let's jump over to uh, see what, what is the end of all these things? What is the final picture that we're gonna look at? Well, we're gonna look at uh, the book of Revelation and uh, the, we're gonna segue out into Zechariah and Old Testament. Let's jump, since we're in the New Testament already, flip over a couple of chapters to the book of Revelation. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 19 and verses 11 through 14. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a, with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven Followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And so what we see then is that Revelation chapter 19 verses 11 gives us the second coming of Christ. That is the event that ends the day of the Lord or Yom Kippur or the day of the Lord's wrath and initiates the beginning of the feast of booths or tabernacles or Sukkot when the Lord is dwelling with the nation of Israel and the Gentile believers. And he comes back with his eyes like a flame of fire, clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven come with him. That's us, the church that's now become the bride of Christ, and our supernatural resurrection bodies come back with Jesus Christ. And at this point, the wrath of God and the judgment of God for sin takes place Initially, the Antichrist and the beast go into the lake of fire. Satan goes into the bottomless pit. Everybody that took the mark of the beast is killed. They go into Hades to await their trial and sentencing and placement in the lake of fire, which will come a thousand years later. And so we see then the day of the Lord ends with the wrath of God coming from the person of Jesus, who's coming this time not to be a suffering servant, not a little baby in a swaddling clothes or anything like that, or to die stripped naked and humiliated, but rather to, you know, wreak vengeance of the Lord upon the wicked of the earth who have followed after Satan. Now let's jump over to one of the final books of the New Testament, Zechariah, which is a type of corollary, uh, uh, Old Testament sort of corollary to the book of Revelation. Let's take a look at Zechariah chapter, uh, let's start Revelation, uh, Zechariah chapter uh, 12 and read for me verses 2 and 3. That really applies here. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in, in, in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. See, so that's the second coming of Christ. You know, the burden of the Lord against Israel it says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness, a cup of trembling to all the nations round about when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. That's going to happen during the Battle of Armageddon, uh, during the final few days of the 70th week of Daniel. Then the Lord will come back at the 1260th day after the abomination of desolation when Antichrist goes into the temple that has been rebuilt in Jerusalem and declares himself to be God. 1260 days later, we have Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 14, the second coming of Christ, which Zechariah gives us a foreshadowing 500 years before the birth of Christ. Zechariah sees prophetically what happens. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the nations round about. 
you know, uh, all the people who would heave it away will be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. All of the nations of the earth are gathered, are gathered against Israel at Armageddon. And Jesus comes back at Armageddon to rescue the nation of Israel from certain uh, utter destruction. Now, verses 10 through 12 of Zechariah chapter 12, Stephen. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplications. And they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day shall there, shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadidadrab, in the valley of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart. And so what we see then is Zechariah has given us the same picture, the second coming of Christ, Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 14, only Zechariah says this in Zechariah 12, verse 10. He says, you know, then they will look upon me whom they have pierced. Huh starts out, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. God's going to reveal to the nation of Israel who his son really is. Then they will look upon me whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for firstborn. Israel will have repented of the rejection of Jesus some 2,000 years earlier and will accept him as their Messiah and the King of Israel, and he will save them at this time. And it says that in that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo, which is where this disastrous thing occurred in the valley of Megiddo prior to Armageddon some 3,500 years earlier. It was another battle with, you know, where people were mourning in this uh, natural uh, geographic location, a, a flat plain surrounded by mountains called the valley of Megiddo or uh, there was a city named Megiddo that was uh, uh, stationed at the, at the foot of those mountains. So that valley became known as the Valley of uh, Armageddon or the Mountains of Megiddo, which was a city that was uh, prominent in the Old Testament times around the time of King David. But that's where the final battle of the planet Earth is going to be held when they are trying to wipe out the nation of Israel and God is going to send Jesus. Jesus, God in human flesh, will rescue the nation of Israel. They will acknowledge him as the Messiah and then atonement will be made for them because they've repented of their rejection and they'll accept the blood sacrifice that occurred 2,000 years earlier and Jesus will have been waiting for them to repent. And once they do, we find out and we'll conclude with Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. In that day, there shall be a, a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. There you go. And so we have a fountain that will be opened <coughs> Excuse me. when Jesus comes back to the earth. A fountain will be opened up in that day, the day of the second coming of Christ, for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem uh, for sin and for uncleanness. And the day of atonement will be made finally, permanently, for the nation of Israel, the day of the second coming of Christ, the 1260th day after the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And so with that, that is our picture or type of the day of atonement. The day of atonement now has begun. I look out my window as we were speaking those words. It is now pitch black out and darkness has covered the land. The day of atonement has begun for the nation of Israel and for Jews all over the world. And for anyone who's a follower or believer of Jesus Christ, it's also the day of atonement for us where we have an obligation to commemorate the crucifixion of Jesus sure. for our sins, not for his sins, he didn't have any sins, for our sins, and that we don't have to be panicked or afraid like our Jewish brothers and sisters do, you know, many of whom live right here on Miami Beach, um, you know, uh, as they're like, man, am I going to be, in, is the Lord going to switch me out of the, the, Lord, the Lord's book of death into the book of life? Because, you know, this whole year I'm trying to, these last 10 days I was really repenting. We don't have to have that fear. I had fear like that when I was in elementary school. And I, you know, I didn't know 
anything about sex. I didn't think about like you know, it, you know, crime. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about much of anything. But I knew I was a sinner. You know, I stole cookies out of the cookie jar or lied and you know said I didn't. You know, uh, you know, take the last piece of cake out of the refrigerator when I know I did. You know, stuff like that. I knew I was a sinful kid. And so when I found out about hell, I knew, oh, uh, that would be a place for me. You know, for, you know, unless you're perfect, and I'm not. And then I found out there was a way out of hell called Jesus. And I was like, dude, sign me the freak up. Yes, I'm in. And I had that burden lifted off. I had the burden even as a kid, Steve, even wow. in elementary school. If I knew I was condemned in sin and on my way to hell in elementary school, how about some adult that spent their whole the, the lady was the prostitute and then came to Christ. I was listening to uh, David Berkowitz, the former son of Sam, talking about the satanic murders that he committed to glorify Satan and, and to serve him and how, you know, only he said only the blood of Christ could wash away those sins. You know, I mean, you know, I'm not the son of Sam. I'm the son of hope. He said, you know, because Jesus washed away all my blood guilt. And for a guy who was involved in that serial killing back in 1976 through 77, you know, now he's an awesome, awesome testimony for the Lord. And, and the same is true for us. So as Yom Kippur has now just begun, we have a sober and, and somber, uh, you know, uh, time of reflection, but also a time of thanksgiving and gratitude. I'm a sinner, Lord. I... Day of Atonement, I should be on sackcloth and ashes, I'm burning goats at the temple. For me, you need a whole, like, you know, herd of goats, you know, burn up all my sins. But because you died on the cross and your one death was exponentially more valuable than a trillion goats in God's eyes. And because you love me, I, I get to have that applied to me without having to do anything or join anything or buy anything. Gosh, that's just, that's, that's loving. Well, what can I do in exchange? Glad that you asked, kid. As, as a matter of fact, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. And so, Kim, you were asking um, what we're going to be talking about on Saturday so you could study. We were talking about the Great Commission. You know, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the mission of the church. And we're going to be looking at that on uh, Saturday on South Beach as we introduce our, our new helper. It's going to come in uh, by the Lord's grace. And as you are stepping off the set, in the stage of South Beach yeah. to a new mission field. So just like in the book of Acts, where Paul was commending Timothy and Titus to, remember it says, and, and you know, uh, uh, Timothy and Titus and Barnabas were commended to the work. Mm -hmm. What work? Uh, sharing the gospel. That was the work of the church. That was your job. Yeah. You came to Christ, now you've got a job to go out and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, being born again by faith in God, John three sixteen for the rest of your life. That's your job. And so these faithful men were, you know, given the right hand of fellowship and commended to the work of the Lord. And so Baptist churches use that sort of phraseology, you know, you're a commended worker. Mm -hmm. You know, different evangelical churches, you're a comm you're a commended worker and they give you a letter and they sort of give you, and then you can go off and do ministry at another city or state where you go to, you get the little commendation letter from the, from the church pastor. So I'm giving you a commendation letter, Steve. So um, and, and as a matter of fact, I, I, in fact, I do, you know, it's your last day here as part of South Beach Gospel Ministries, Miami Beach campus. Now you're going out to extend out South Beach Gospel Ministries to Dothan, Alabama. So we got Genevieve up in DC. We've got, uh, Vaughn in Wisconsin. He hasn't gotten his tracks yet, but you'll be getting them. Um, and... We're going to have me, now we're going to have, you know, Kim helping out down here on South Beach, but you're, you're being commended to the work. So now, just like Paul sent Timothy and Titus out as junior pastor, now, you know, Paul's like, I'm getting ready to die now. Guess what, fellas, I got news for you. You're in charge. Now you got your own ministry to run. Now you got all the problems and the heartaches, and the, but the Lord is going to be with you. And now you're going to get even more rewards. So, yes, um, I do have a going away present for you, Steve. So step right on up to the camera. Say hello. And, and, go, and we're really, it's, it, what is it? Uh, it? Au revoir is the French word. We will see you again. It's not goodbye. It's we'll see you again. Maybe the rapture will occur and I won't see you until the rapture. I don't know. Maybe you come back. I know you're going to come back to, you plan to come back and visit and stuff like that. But um, step on up to the camera there. 
And so I'm commending you, Steve. We're going to pray in the Lord's name right now. Lord, we just pray. And I commend my man, Steve, my brother, Steve, to go out and do the work of an evangelist, Lord. And all the stuff that he's seen here that you'd be able to put in his heart, the good stuff that he saw, that he could be using it when he's over in Dothan, Alabama, trying to continue the work that we're doing here. So, Lord, just thank you for having this guy with me for 10 years and giving me all this stuff. And I pray the Lord's grace and blessing as we commend you to the work of the Lord um, and, and the Lord will go with you while we are part one from another. So with that, Steve, stay where, where you are because I got you a nice going away right. present. And here we go. And <laughs> there you are. Great. You got right there. There's there his going is, away present. <laughs> He's got several thousand tracks that say South Beach Gospel Ministries, and it's got our little logo that I designed and our Facebook and YouTube pages. So these little video teachings and Bible studies and house church meetings that we have, which we're, by the grace of the Lord, able to videotape, Steve will be able to get a whole new group of folks down in the south of Alabama to, to, to get. So he's doing the work. So he's going to continue our ministry, but he's going to do it from our satellite campus, so we're branching out. That's right. So there you go. This is your present. This isn't a gold Rolex, but pretend <laughs> like it is. In essence, this is far more valuable, boys and girls. Far more valuable than gold is this. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Some of those powerful tracks I've ever read. Chick tracks I've been reading since a kid, and I still get choked up and tearful whenever I read these. So here you go. Several thousand. Now you got work to do, and I'll leave you to it. Here's Thank your you present. Sir. And uh, here's a... Here's another present. And so for Genevieve, who's out there, here's yours. You got, your box is now all packed up. You got about one half of what Steve had. You only got about a thousand tracks to work because um, I can't afford to send uh, 3,000 tracks in the mail. Um, but these will be coming any day now. So you be looking for that, uh, Genevieve, up in DC. So Steve and Genevieve are gonna be doing the work and Steve's gonna be out of here. So this is the last time and so, it's with great sadness that I see my brother go, you know, but Paul had to do the same with Timothy and Titus and he shipped them out. And at least I'm not, you know, in the dungeon of the Mamertine prison waiting to get my head cut off. Though I wouldn't necessarily mind it, to be quite honest with you. The rapture is going to take a, a whole lot of time. I was thinking about today. I was like, Lord, if, if the rapture is going to be like another five or six years from now, or I could get martyred by like some satanic, you know, coven tomorrow, uh, you know, uh, while I'm out of the South Beach preaching on Saturday, I'll take the, you know, I'll take the martyr's crown. You know, get me out of here now. So with that then, that's it, man. We're done. Yom Kippur has begun, the Day of Atonement. And this is a, a perfect time to say, you know, goodbye to my man Steve. And I'm sending him off to a box of 2,000 tracks to throw in a truck. And he'll be out Saturday morning at the same time that Kim and I, Kim will be starting out you know, taking Steve's spot. Look for her testimony on Saturday on YouTube. Um, and Steve will be in Dalton, Alabama in the town square doing the same thing at the same time. So we'll talk on the phone beforehand and we'll pray for one another and all that. So we're spreading out and Genevieve will be able to join in the fun as soon as her tracks get, uh, get up there from the postal service. But she's already doing, she's already taking our videos and sending them around to people all over the world. So Genevieve is our PR person, man. So uh, uh, good on you, man. So, and welcome. Can't wait to introduce you all to Kim on Saturday and all that. And so with that, then Steve closes out and a word of prayer for the final time before the rapture, I guess. Lord God, I thank you for, for the opportunity to be part of this ministry, Lord, to be part of the, the mission that you, you you let us all, once we believe on you, Lord, that you that you encourage us all to be part of, to go out and share the gospel. Lord, it's a small thing for us to do for hmm. such a great price you paid for us. And, hmm. you know, if, if that's what thanks us for you, every time I get a chance, Lord, it's, it's all yours. It's certainly, you know, just a... Appreciate the time. Appreciate the time with her. Oh Lord, it's just, I uh, just I don't know where in the world you would have sent me. And we're not sure, you know, how else I would have worked out. But Lord, I can't imagine you could have could have placed me with uh, with a better mentor, with a better pastor for a little small ministry, the leader of the rebellion. Lord, just mm. thank you for the time that we had here, and pray that we, you know, if if you do tarry, which I pray, Lord, that you don't. Yeah. But if you do, that uh, that we're we're made to we're able to uh, continue to be fruitful uh, for this little ministry. You just All right. Amen. All righty. You get to hit the button for the last time.